Do you know how the Morgenthau family influenced American history and how they made their fortune? In part two of the Andrew Meyer interview, the author answers questions about the Morgenthau dynasty's role in American history and how they acquired their wealth. Hello, it's Victoria from HEC Books, where we get the scoop on the latest books straight from the author. If this is your first time here, make sure you click the subscribe button. Watch to the end to see a bonus clip and find out what classic American cuisine one of the Morgenthaus served a certain king and queen on their first official visit. Now, here's more on Morgenthau, power, privilege, and the rise of an American dynasty. One of the main themes is this is an American family and what it meant to be American. And you say that actually early on, and I might have been with Lazarus, the original, but or one of the children that that was their goal to be American. Um, yeah. I remember reading that. But yeah. and, and that's one thing you do a great job at offering historical context into the story. Uh, was that made simpler by the simple fact that the family's place in history, no matter what generation, seems to parallel big events? Yeah. Uh, well, it, <laughs> it's both. It's both a blessing and a burden because when you're up against someone like Eleanor Roosevelt or someone like FDR, I mean, FDR just steals every scene or Winston Churchill. I mean, Winston Churchill is at the family farm and Bob, the future DA, is back from the war. He served both in the Mediterranean at 21, 22, 23 years old. He enlisted before Pearl Harbor as a junior in college. I mean, he really wanted to, as he said, he wanted to go fight the Nazis. And he's serving cocktails to Winston Churchill. I mean, you, you just have to pinch yourself. Is this possible? Is this true? And really, will Victoria and, and the rest of the readers believe this? Because, right. you know, it is they are constantly on the stage with these uh, political celebrities of the 20th century again and again and again. And um, uh, I ended up seeing where they fit in in ways that they themselves might not have even seen. Um, how important, for instance, the Treasury Secretary was to the New Deal, to right. arming Europe, again, before World War, uh, before Pearl Harbor, the attack on Pearl Harbor. Morgenthau and Roosevelt, against American law, armed the French um, and the English, very much like what's going on in Ukraine today. So there are all these echoes. And Henry Sr., he was never senior in life. He was kind of a larger than life character, first of all, in New York real estate. He was one of the first real estate um, uh, bundlers and barons. He physically cobbled together what's now known as Times Square. At one point, he owned the Plaza Hotel. He built much of Wall Street. And then, by his own words, he took over the Democratic Party. He bought the Democratic Party in 1912 for Woodrow Wilson, who obviously becomes president after serving one term, Wilson served one term as the governor of New Jersey, almost a complete unknown, a political novice, son and grandson of Presbyterian ministers, very unlikely, populist, progressive politician who does something really kind of extraordinary. He begins talking to all the different ethnic groups and the minorities in New York City, among them German Jews, but also mm -hmm. Poles, Italians, women. He opens up the Democratic Party. Um, and Henry Morgenthau, the real estate, that, then he was flush with money. He owned a lot of northern Manhattan. How wealthy were they at one time? Okay, Lazarus, we said rags to riches, back to rags. But then there's the, you know, his, his children and beyond. Um, were they back in the, I guess it's kind of the Gilded Age somewhat, um, the Astors, the Vanderbilts, were they at that level? Yeah, well, it's a, it's a great question. And actually, the DA, uh, Robert Morgan, thought used to, oh, it was one of the things that really stuck in his cry. It's like, we weren't that wealthy. You know, we're not that wealthy. When he passed away, he left behind a, a, a goodly sized estate. Um, and he used to sort of snarl at me, well, New York's an expensive town. Uh, and I've got a lot of kids, um, <laughs> both, of which, both of which, of course, are true. But it goes back to the Gilded Age. Lazarus comes over 1866, obviously the end of the Civil War. I, I got to avoid the Civil War, thank goodness. It's 150 years of history, but not the Civil War. He came over with some money. He had been extremely wealthy in Germany. He had been a cigar baron 
four factories, a thousand workers, one of the richest men in Mannheim, Germany. He owned this huge mansion, uh, which still exists today. He lost it all um, because Lincoln, um, much like today, had slapped on these Civil War tariffs against any German, really any foreign goods, but especially tobacco. And so Lazarus' business sunk. Um, but Henry, as I said, was a real estate magnet, made a fortune. Um, he had more than a million dollars um, as early as 1915, World War I, and when he's the ambassador uh, to Turkey. He's already an extremely wealthy guy. He wasn't at the level of the Astors, who really controlled um, New York real estate, but he was the first to get John Jacob Astor, the famous Astor patriarch, to sell. From what we know and what, from what the deeds show, he was the first to get John Jacob Astor to actually sell property. You see, you never sold property. You just held it. It was a nice monopoly. Um, and, and certainly, so he had money. So it's a great question how much money they had. It, it, during, right before the crash, there were more than one or two or three million dollars in the family. Uh, crash 1929. So it was quite a bit of money um, in the 1930s. Um, and they never really uh, spent it. Um, exorbitantly at all. So it's not, to answer your question, it's not, it's not the Rothschilds, it's not the Whitney's, um, but certainly with Franklin Roosevelt, with the Roosevelt's, uh, Franklin Roosevelt didn't have a lot of money. Um, they were the people he went to for a good time for many reasons, the least of which being money, but they had the big farm where they could lay out a clam bake, for instance, whenever Franklin wanted to come down because Eleanor Roosevelt uh, hated cooking. Her cooking was horrific, and Roosevelt loved to eat, and he loved to entertain, and he could really, as you said, he could be himself um, around the Morgenthau's. They were very, very close. You know, it's interesting. Um, so I'm going to fast forward to present day. Uh, Bob, the DA, for those, again, to keep everybody straight, um, worked until he was 90, as I was mentioned. But none of his seven children, from what I read, uh, showed interest, have shown an interest in public life, like he did in some of his uh, uh, relatives. What's your take on the Morgenthau dynasty then? Does it end with Bob, the, di the district attorney who just passed not too long ago? Right. It's a great question. Um, his oldest daughter, Jenny Morgenthau, for many, many years, decades, in fact, um, ran something called the Fresh Air Fund um, oh, yeah. in, New York, in New York City, which it's not a public office, but it's certainly public service to bring kids out of the city um, into f literally fresh air um, in the summers. And um, his other children have done similar uh, endeavors. His youngest son, Josh, now runs that family farm um, outside New York City. It's about an, out an hour outside. And again, it's not public office, but I do think you could call it um, uh, a kind of public service. Um, uh, certainly, certainly the locals and a lot of people come from New York for uh, um, for the, the big fall festivals, pumpkin picking, et cetera. And it's all organic and they make their own treasury cider now. Good plug for his treasury, delicious treasury <laughs> cider. Um, but uh, the DA's older brother, Henry, who I mentioned passed away at 101. He was involved in public television um, for most of his life, was really a pioneer of public television. His daughter, Sarah Morgenthau, she's held a number of different positions in Washington. And she's a, an attorney herself. She actually did just run for Congress. So she certainly continues and has aspirations and hopes to continue for elective office. Uh, I think some of the family, I haven't talked to everyone, um, uh, wonder about the, the word dynasty. They see it as I do. It's a family. And, and really, it's an American family. That's, you know, that's the point that I was trying to make. Thanks again for joining us and watch for part three of the Andrew Meyer interview, where we will delve into the process and tricks Meyer used to write his book. Make sure to subscribe for new content and click the thumbs up to like this video. Or 1939, it's the first time that a British king and queen, George VI and Elizabeth, come to America. It was the first royal visit. And Bob would tell me stories. And then I found that he had um, served hot dogs at Hyde Park at Roosevelt's house uh, to the king and queen. And then I found all the documents from the time because Roosevelt was really involved in that visit. He loved royalty. And it actually was extremely important for the relationship that came during World War II, obviously.